What's going on, military cash flow family? Yo, today's episode is so powerful. So powerful. Yo, like I, I blanked out a couple of times, like just thinking about some of the things that we were talking about. So if, if you'll notice, I kind of go quiet for a second, like uh <laughs> I'm thinking through my own stuff. And then we even had like an awesome conversation right after yep. the right after the show, right? Like what about 15, 20 minutes we were talking about it. But um yeah. before we get into that, what's going on with you today, Mike? What's up? Nothing much, man. I'm still shook my damn self. Well, like you said. <laughs> I mean, this, this podcast is, is, uh, is legit, man. This is uh, something that um, I've been, I, we were just talking about, it. I've been struggling with just trying to redefine my why everybody always has our whys, right. And, and it changes over time. So a lot of times it's like, yo, let's, let's reach financial freedom. And then there's different levels of financial freedom and all that good stuff. But then once you get to a certain point, you've accomplished deals, you know, that you're much more confident to go out and get a deal and get it to close money becomes much less of a concern. And it's, what's next right so having that deep rooted why is always extremely important and then redefining it is always a struggle as you go along um and and our guest eric eric upchurch i'll let you finish off the intro here but he touches a lot on um towards the end towards you gotta listen to it all i got you got you you're stuck but no but you gotta you gotta listen to it all guys because at the end he really goes into that after he explains this whole journey man but it is extremely powerful and enlightening and now i got homework to do man but how's everything going with you man yeah everything on my end's good uh we're finishing up this refi you know so hopefully yep, yep. what next next week we should be closing you know with your uh finishing up the refi with our very own mike glassby the the loan Ooh. officer right just killing it um so really excited about that uh should be getting a, a nice big check back which i'm really looking forward to <laughs> so we're trying to figure out what the next move uh we're going to do with the the investing side of the house when we, once we get that that money back we'll be sure to look out for the video i'll do a whole video on that um but yeah other than that just uh you know just just living life just having fun and now i'm sitting here like trying to figure out uh, what's going on after our guest. So our guest today, Eric Upchurch, Mike already kind of talked about it and touched on it, but uh, we, we talked about uh, the levels of why. We talked about just his journey in general, right? So this guy, uh, Eric Upchurch, he's part of Active Duty Passive Income. As you guys know, we, we've shouted him out a few times on our shows. Um, another another uh, awesome group of service members that got together, created a podcast, created a whole education platform. Uh, it's really great stuff. Definitely go check him out. Um, and they got, uh, but Eric Upchurch is one of the key founding members, right? And he was uh, started off in the army and then, um, you know, got out. He was an E6 when he got out. And then he just, you know, he linked together and really started taking some serious action, networked his butt off. And then he's at a place now to where I think he said, what, like, seven, like 600 units or something like that. Uh, over um, a thousand. He's okay, at 1,052 over, units. You're right. So over a thousand, over a thousand units now um, in a matter of what, three or four years or something like that. And, and you would think that's what we, what we would talk about and what he'd be most passionate about and who, what he would get excited about is that journey. Right. But the biggest journey is, was his why the biggest, or the biggest part of the conversation was his why and in his story to finding his why. Right. And that was, in my opinion, the most impactful part of this entire uh this entire episode right um so uh, i i'm not going to do it any justice as far as getting into it like mike said you just gotta listen to this episode you know and, and you'll see where it's at what's going on military cash flow today we got a special guest eric upchurch from adpi Welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you so much for coming, uh, coming and joining us today. Uh, could you, would you mind telling our audience a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you're from, and what you're doing in the real estate space? Yeah, you bet. Hey, guys, thanks for having me. Um, I appreciate you doing what you're doing and supporting the military audience, and uh, you know, just telling everybody else uh, the stuff that we wish we knew back when, right? <laughs> That's what it's all about. So, yeah, I uh, grew up in the Midwest, moved out to California. Uh, right after high school with a buddy of mine, uh, went to, I'll make this short, went to culinary school, thought I wanted to do that. Uh, my wife, my uh, girlfriend at the time's uh, mom signed me up for college. So I ended up getting an associate's degree, then transferred to get my bachelor's degree, chose to be enlisted after college versus becoming an officer 
for two reasons. One, I wanted to influence people and I, I'd actually ended up in a managerial position in every job I'd had prior to the age of 24, from 12 to 24 years old. And, um, and so I knew I wanted to influence people, not like influence or influence, but like, I knew that I wanted to, to help other people learn the stuff that I did. Right. Um, and then another thing, it was the loan repayment program in the army paid off all of my college debt. So that was a huge uh, kicker for me as well. So I ended up um, in special operations, the entire um, enlistment uh, career. And the only reason was because I was trying to make it to my wedding. Um, I enlisted basic training and advanced individual training, AIT. Uh, it was a, about a six month period. And all I could think was, okay, my wedding's in July. This is January. My wedding's in July. I can't mess up. I can't, I can't screw this up for my wife and for the 120 guests we have back in California. There was no plan B. So I ended up top of my class. And because I was top of my class, they, they selected me for special operations. Didn't even, that wasn't even on my radar. And um, uh, so anyway, long story short, uh, ended up as a um, staff sergeant in the army and loved everything I did. I got to go to a lot of cool schools and influence 27 guys under my uh, chain of command. And uh, it was pretty great. Then like a lot of military uh, folks, I became an accidental landlord bought a house, the VA loan in 2006, 100% leverage, awesome time to buy a house, 100% leverage, which was 2006, right before the bubble, right? Well, 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 we got a lot to, we got a lot to unpack there, man. I, I, want, right, to, right, I want you to keep right. going, but I definitely want to go into uh, just a little bit of the backstory a little bit before yeah. we go into the real estate journey. Cause I think it's, it's um, what you did there, right? When you said you chose to be uh, enlisted over officer because yeah, you sure. influence people, right? I kind of want to yeah. touch on that a little bit because uh, as you know, man, a lot of a lot of people in our audience, uh, in your audience as well, obviously we're all military here, right? Um, yep. There are a lot of enlisted soldiers that go to college, right? And then they're faced with the same decision. Um, how did you know to like, hey, I'm going to have more influence over individual soldiers or I yeah. guess that, that kind of... Um, I don't know, like really bond, right? Enlisted versus versus officer. How, how did you, how did that work for you? Yeah. One, it, it was a lot of research. Um, and just looking at the, I was, I was the guy of 24 years old college grad grilling my, um, my recruiter. I mean, I was probably his biggest pain in the ass he's ever had, <laughs> but I was like, Hey dude, if I'm going to go put myself in harm's way, I want to get the most out of it. I want to make sure that I'm um, I got the job that I want, the bonus I want, the, the whatever programs I have out there, whatever's in my enlistment contract. I want to make sure it's all in there because I'd heard horror stories about going to MEPS and signing on the dotted line because then they switch your MOS to like 11 Bravo and all of a sudden you're in the infantry and you're like, what did I just do? You know? So um, anyway, a lot of research, but then also self-reflection. Um, I, I look back at 24 years old, I, you know, I was looking back and going, okay, what have I done in my life to get to this point? And my now wife, girlfriend at the time, when we were talking about this, um, she was like, well, you've always been a leader. And, and so, you know, working in the cornfields of Iowa, 12 years old, I became a team leader walking in the corn rows, you know, behind a team after I learned how to do that. And I loved that. And I, I kind of inherently gravitated to becoming a manager or team leader in every job that I had ever had up until that point. And so I didn't try to do that. But you, you guys know, sometimes your personality and just what you, what you like to do comes out. And so I'd always kind of uh, gone towards that. So then I just figured, okay, well, they're going to pay off all my college debt. I like to influence people. I feel like I can, you know, move my way up through the ranks and have more guys, you know, under my belt close to me that I can really influence these 18 year old knuckleheads who've never been out of their County before joining the military. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, I've got a little life experience and some college and some stuff. So I, I actually ended up loving that part of the job. I mean, every single one of my soldiers at least form a curriculum and apply to college. All 27 of them had to do that. And I would give them time off during the day, the duty day to go to their on post, you know, um, curriculum if they needed to. And because of that, a lot of them have college degrees now. So I uh, got a lot that's, out of that. That's awesome, man. Cause I, I was actually in the same boat. I joined the military after I got my bachelor's and I was in the ROTC program. Awesome. I was, you know, knocking that out, but I decided to go enlisted as well. Now I have to ask you, this is kind of a loaded question, but I just, just out of curiosity, I'm sure the audience would like to know too, is there anything that you regret about selecting enlisted over officer? If you could redo it again, or if you had known prior to doing that? 
not a single thing because I actually, after I got in, got to the unit, went through um, special operations, enlisted qualification course, did a couple cool schools, and then applied to officer candidate school. I learned that I could then apply for officer candidate school. Yep. So I applied for OCS and flight and got selected through the USASOC chain of command through a direct select um, program and ended up, long story short, denying orders. I submitted a 4187 denying orders because my buddies were Blackhawk pilots and they're like, dude, you're already in 160th. If you like what you're doing and you're not sure that you're going to make a career out of this, do not go to the regular army. <laughs> Don't go. Yeah. Become a like, staff officer. You're gonna, exactly. That's what they said. Yeah. They're like, you're going to be serving coffee at the battalion level, just trying to get your flight hours in and you're going to hate it. So, uh, so I took that and my wife and I weren't sure if we were going to, I mean, we would have owed an additional eight years and I was only two yeah. years in at that point. So what did I know? Yep. So uh, anyway, long, you know, looking forward now or looking back now, my old commanding officer now works for ADPI, which is amazing. He's a, he's a full bird Colonel just retiring after 20 years at, for USASOC for actually for SOCOM. And now he works for our company. So it's pretty, pretty awesome to go full circle. That's, that's, that is that's awesome. wild. That is absolutely wild. Yeah. And I think that's so important to highlight because I mean, often there, oftentimes there's a stigma with, um, within like our community. Like if, if you're enlisted and you only do like one term, you know, what are you going to do when you get out? Right. Like it's, yeah. it's, there, there's not, um, we're not talking about becoming CEOs of a, of, of a, of a company that's ever growing. Right. Like we're not talking about like growing your company so big to where your brigade commander or a yeah. colonel would come and then work for that company. Right. So I think that's extremely crucial to highlight and understanding like how, you know, rank is irrelevant when it comes to the real world, right? And what you can do within the real world. Don't let your whatever rank and your perceived uh, ideas that you have about a certain rank in the military follow you outside of the outside of that uh, career. At least I've seen that a lot. I don't know about your experience, but I, I've literally seen that several times. So I'm curious uh, if you guys have had any, I've seen that or what your experience with that is. Yeah, I, I would say for guys who are considering, guys and gals considering getting out, um, one good reason to do that is if, if you have a plan in place, and, I mean, you know, military cash flow. are you making money now? Do you have a side hustle? What's going on? What have you learned aside from the military? Cause we know they put, they put financial education on the heels of like a, uh, yeah. you know, a, like a, <laughs> yeah. a four day weekend safety brief PowerPoint. No one's paying attention. Yep. They're already thinking about the bar. You got a PowerPoint. Yeah. That must be some, yeah. some, uh, yeah. some special yeah. operations yeah. stuff. Some high, high speed <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Big, bold letters. Don't get arrested is what the PowerPoints were. Uh, yeah. you know, don't drink and drive, you know, 24% interest. Yeah. So, <laughs> so have a plan. And if you don't have a plan and you don't have any experience, now there are resources out there, including military cash flow, to, to get like, go learn something, you know, go connect and go try a side hustle and then get out. Or another way to do it, if you're bold is burn the boats. And that's a, that's an entrepreneurial, yeah. if you know, you have a, an entrepreneurial spirit and drive commitment and drive are essential for that. But you're like, I'm going to go make this happen. There is no alternative. This is my passion. I know I'm going to succeed because I will never quit. If that's your attitude too, and you can find the resources when you get out and you know that then go ahead and get out. Otherwise, you know, consider enlist, you know, re-enlisting and staying in and figure it out for the next, you know, two, three, five years, whatever it is. Love and I'm, I know we're going to jump into your, your real estate experience here shortly, but this passion, this conviction as you speak, it sounds like it's seasoned, but has it always been there? You talk about the leadership uh, experience that you had walking through the cornfields. Did you have a good foundation for finances, for financial literacy as a child, or how did that develop over time? I wish it was. See, again, it's a, one of those, I wish it was. The only, it, in my household, I grew up just barely middle class in the Midwest. Like if I wanted soccer cleats, I needed to go mow lawns. Right. Mm -hmm. It was that type of thing. We weren't poor, but it was like, okay, go mow lawns, go, you know, detassel corn in the cornfields to afford whatever extra thing that Nintendo or those air Jordans or whatever it is. Right. might've just dated myself there a little bit, but, um, but, but Hey, Jordan, so Jordans are always around. Those, yeah, those that's true. Always, Jordan, yeah. These are the original <laughs> Jordans. All right. So, yeah. yeah. So, but so, there was work ethic there, but then it was like recognition 
later on and, and, and financial stuff was, was faux pas. Like you don't ta totally taboo. You don't talk about financial stuff. All you see is your parents like trying to hammer through some checks. Like once a month, there's like the check writing day, you know, like stressed mm -hmm. out, everyone's yelling and stressed and whatever, and just bills piled up and whatever. So the only other thing that I had was my dad. I remember one time sitting on my dad's lap and he opened up a newspaper and he was looking at his mutual funds. Like they used to print them out in the newspaper, looking at his, the ticker for his mutual fund. And I remember that and going like, what the heck is he doing other than that? And there was like barely an explanation. I was probably 14 at the time or something. Yeah. Other than that, it was like, you got, I got to go figure it out on my own. So I, thankfully I did. And it was through kind of what I mentioned earlier is like, accidental landlord holy crap i gotta get my stuff together you know so let's dive into that let's talk yeah. about this accidental landlord situation how did this yeah. play out well thankfully um i had read dave ramsey total money makeover and i am a dave ramsey fan for just the foundation stuff and completely not a fan of what he says to do or what he says not to do later I think that uh, you've got, you know, I used the whole debt snowball thing. It was fantastic. It got us out of all of our debt, credit card debt, everything. My wife's um, uh, uh, college debt was paid off and all that stuff. Thanks, thanks to Dave Ramsey. But then it's like, you need to leverage credit cards. You need to leverage good debt. You need to do some of the things he says not to do, but that's because he's still talking to the knuckleheads out there that don't understand. There's this whole other world of billionaires and millionaires that learn something different. So that's great. So I, I want to just preface this by saying great for those of you who are like diehard uh, Dave Ramsey fans. That was step one for me. Step two was, okay, now I'm, I'm deployed in Iraq. One, my first of five deployments, I'm in Iraq. My wife signs on the line. We buy this new construction home in Savannah, Georgia, hundred percent leverage with the VA loan, the, clo the, the um, builder paid closing costs. So I like literally went to the closing table with nothing out of pocket. And in 2006, and obviously then the market crashed and my wife and I, when I ETS in 11, uh, 2011, my wife was like, well, what are we going to do with the house? You know, we're moving back to San Francisco Bay area. So I just crunched some numbers, talked to the property, man a property management company. And they're like, yeah, you can rent it for, um, 1200 bucks a month, something like that. And, and we owed like 11 with the property management fee, we would owe like 1120 a month. So I'm like, okay, 80 bucks a month is my cash flow quote unquote for those of you like listening you to Thank this, you for right <laughs> and because the ac breaks in savannah georgia that's 385 dollars, and that happens twice a summer you know and so I, I i didn't deliberately buy this house as an asset in the future which is now what we teach people to do you got to think about it first as okay what's my next two years going to look like what's it going to look like in five and eight years from now am i going to be able to keep this thing maybe i should get something that's a little less expensive that's in a decent neighborhood that can cash flow better when i move because chances are as a military member you're going to pcs yes, you're going to be on to your next duty station i also in retrospect what about a fourplex with that va loan yeah. not just not just a single family but anyway so that's how i became an accidental landlord cash flowing 80 dollars a month which so i i was back in the bay area and going like okay, there's something to that. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and he did it. He did it a little smarter than I did, but he did it with intention. So I'm like, how can I learn how to do it with intention? What, what, what's my next step? And so then I started looking into what can I do in the San Francisco Bay Area to, to make this work for me. Excellent. I, I love everything about that, especially focusing on that point about the, the you know, cash flowing, because I yeah. think that's a, a common theme uh, within the military community. I understand what, where it's coming from. Like, Hey, you want to buy a house, a piece of the American dream, if, you know, you, it's going to appreciate and value those so on and so forth. But uh, we're typically not thinking with the end in mind when it comes to that. And I, I think you highlighted that very, very well. Uh, another thing I, I really like that you touched on was that Dave Ramsey piece? Because that's another thing that gets brought up a lot. That the uh, that argument, right? Like I think there's a spectrum. There's Dave Ramsey on here, and then you got people like Robert Kiyosaki or or Grant Cardone on this side. Um, <clears throat> so I, just like you said, I think you know you start off here, and then you eventually slowly grab you know graduate as your net worth increases to the other side. Um, and maybe maybe it's not all the way Grant Cardone. Maybe it's not you know <laughs> super 10x, but you know you definitely do graduate from that you know, uh, Dave Ramsey, if you really want to use your money to leverage and actually build well. So I, I really, really yeah. like that. Yeah. He's, he's made a great, uh, you know, living off of just sticking to his niche and he'll fight to the death, but you know, he's a real estate investor too. 
You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. Like, come on. He's got side hustles like you couldn't believe. He probably owns all kinds of businesses and has all kinds of write-offs and does all kinds of stuff that he cannot teach anyone else to do because it would go against his empire, <laughs> you know? And that's yeah. cool. I get it. I, stick to your niche. I love it. That's, that's a great way to, to do business. And he's helping tons of people. On the other side of that is Grant Cardone. You know, we inter interviewed Grant Cardone. And what I got from that is, I learned, and he is super divisive. You love or love him or hate him. You're all about that 10x energy, or you're just like, that's the stupidest thing in the world, right? Uh, or he's scamming people, or whatever. You know, like there's always naysayers. But what I learned uh, through talking with him is why he is the way he is, and he he has a passion for helping those moms that he experienced when he was growing up. His mom didn't have you know X, Y, and Z explanations for her. She didn't have a way to invest because no one told her she could do that. And so he is unapologetic about just being over the top 10x, and that's his niche. That is completely a good analogy. It's like Dave and 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 Grant are on opposite sides of the spectrum, and that's great. You know, so then we can fill in the gaps somewhere in the middle. I think that's extremely important. It's just finding where you fit in that gap. And over time, it's going to change. It always will. And speaking of niching, niching into to specific categories and changing, when you were in San Francisco, what the hell was your niche? It's an overpriced market. What did you, what did you do to be successful there? I, I got to tell you, um, so what, what are we good at in the military, right? Or we should be situational awareness. So yep. I started reading books, listening to podcasts. I paid, I did hook, line and sinker. I went to the free 90 minute session that led to the thousand dollar tax lien thing and yep. the, and the boot camp, And then that the boot camp got upsold to the $25,000 advanced coaching to flip houses in the San Francisco Bay area in 2014. That, that was when people were paying $2 million for a $1 million listing that was just on fire, literally on fire. And, and, I, and so I'm going like, <clears throat> I'm like, okay, so maybe that's not me. Maybe. And I'm doing the whole thing, like calling agents and brokers and going, Hey, I'm a real estate investor, blah, blah, blah. Like just cold <laughs> calling people. And, and so I'm that guy. But what I learned from that is <clears throat> huge importance was uh, two takeaways. One at that event, I met somebody who made me a quarter million dollars on a live-in flip. Two was the situational awareness. Part of it was I can live in flip. So I bought a house for $500,000, which is the cheapest house I could find in the Bay area at the time. Uh, it was a short sale, beautiful house, all the, um, all the bells and whistles on it. The guy just had to move to Texas. So anyway, I got a steal on it. $500,000 could barely afford the payment with my W2, but qualified zero down. I didn't have a hundred thousand dollars to put down on that house. So zero down. Thankfully I had the VA loan. And that house went from 500 to 690 in two years. And so in the middle of that, I went to that seminar and I talked to my wife and I was like, you know, our house just went up like $190,000 in value. Like maybe we should sell it, sold it, bought a house for 900,000. And this is where that guy that I met at the conference comes in. I bought a house for 900,000 on the beach. Cause we were like, okay, we're going to do this again. We're, when we got kids, two little boys. And so we're going to go live and flip on the beach because it's an awesome location. And we think that this is going to be worth a lot of money someday. So we bought it for 905, put $50,000 that we just made from the house, from the last house into it. The guy I met at the conference did all the contracting work, uh, the design and everything, he had his laborers there. All I had to do was pay for labor and parts, you know, materials. And in, in uh, nine months, we sold that house for 1.158 million. So it was a $250,000 spread in nine months and then moved on and did it a third time in the East Bay. And so the only, that was kind of my capital building phase when I did three live-in flips. That was my niche at the time. While I was learning other things, I was like, what can I do now? And so if you're listening to this and getting started, what can you do now? You can house hack. You know, we wrote a book, Military House Hacking. It teaches you some of the little nuances that military members can do. Buy that fourplex that we mentioned earlier and, and rent out the other units and then move your next duty station and do it again. You know, and, and uh, so there are a lot of cool things you can do. And I would do some, some of those things a little bit differently too now, but know what you're capable of, know what your, what your capabilities are in, in your current situation and just execute, just try something, something, even if you fail is better than nothing. So get after it. I love it. But one, another key takeaway to what you, what you kind of said there, how you did those three living flips was the deliberate action, right? Like you, you did that 
very intentionally. So if you're listening, you're like, oh, well, I'm just going to go buy a house and, you know, <laughs> and like, uh, we'll see what happens. No, like, I, I know that there was analysis behind it, right? Like, yeah. you, you were really doing your analysis to see what the ARV for other properties of like kind or those comparative market analysis with it as well. So there's a little bit of research that goes into it. But yes, I, I absolutely love that, man. That's awesome, awesome, awesome information. I want to try to break something down with you. You mentioned this, and I know it may have glossed over here, but you said it was part of your capital building phase. Yeah. And I think this is extremely important that most people overlook. So could you explain to us in the audience kind of what your thought process is between phases and what's the importance of them? I never had any money in my life. Yeah, I was smart to get out of debt. And I had the military pay off all the way up through my master's degree, actually, while I was in. Military paid for all that because I was paying attention to what my, you know, what was available to me coming back to the Bay area, still no money, but no debt. And so I'm just kind of looking into what can I possibly do? And as, as these things start to happen and as I start to you know, analyze, okay, this deal is going to make me X amount of money at the same time in parallel, I'm like, I know I got to figure out what to do with that money also at some point. Right. And so then I start learning. I start thinking to myself, okay, capital building phase. I mean, okay, let me back up a little bit. I was a staff sergeant, right? I was making what, $42,000 a year. So there was no, there was no money. I don't want people to think that I had money when I was moving back to the Bay area. And so then after I did those three live in flips, I was able to then um, leverage one of my relationships in the past. Cause we know how important networking is, right? I, I talked to a buddy who was syndicating apartments and I was the first time I'd ever heard that. Coincidentally, one of my partners, Markion now said, I have this free ticket to a, a multifamily boot camp. You should go to it. Oh, sure. I'll learn. I love learning. So let's go. And so I invested a big chunk of money that I had made from these um, single, these um, single family live-in flips with my family into my first syndication. And, and, and that's kind of what started the momentum with all of the investing and from there, and you guys know, like zero to one is always the hardest deal. And, and, um, you know, from, you learn and the more you network and the more you try things, the more you learn and the more, more people you, you meet up with new opportunities. So, man, I, I just, from that point, it was, it was kind of off to the races. So it was awesome. Excellent. Yeah. So let, let's talk about that now. So, I mean, we, we've, the audience, you know, you guys don't know, dude, Eric's kind of a big deal, right? Eric and the, the whole ADPI team, is they're kind of a big deal, right? So we're talking about single families. We're talking about doing the, the live-in flips. And now we just talked about, we touched on syndication a little bit, right? So let, let's talk about uh, like the first deal and then where you are now and, and what you're doing in the real space now, right? So yeah. go ahead, take it away. <laughs> yes. So for, for first deal, first deal was, uh, well, I, I consider those first three living flips, but the, then I, then I invested, um, a hundred K, you know, I'm just going to be open about the numbers. Cause the, I didn't make, I didn't earn. I mean, I made that money from being smart. Uh, not, not because I like, you know, I don't know. I, I just feel like really blessed to have fallen into those situations, but like opportunity comes from awareness and doing the hard work, right? Moving my family around nine times in 10 years was not easy to do. And, and um, so there was sacrifice to making that money as well. So anyway, I invested in a 439 unit mobile home park portfolio with a buddy of mine who syndicated, uh, which for those of you who don't know syndication, it's just, um, you know, following SEC guidelines to invest in apartments, uh, you, you invest the equity portion with a bunch of investors, then there's, there's, you know, bank debt on, uh, on the other portion, kind of like buying a house with, with bank debt. And then instead of you paying the 20%, investors pay the 20%. And I was one of those investors. So I was a limited partner, passive investor, which I love passive because you're just making money from your investment and it's secured by a hard asset, by the apartments or by the mobile homes or whatever. So, so from there, you know, I just, I talked about burning the boats. When I went to that seminar, that boot camp for multifamily, my eyes were just like, I was like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Like regular guys like me can do this. No one in my life had ever said that, that I, you know, wearing board shorts and a hoodie can go and buy apartments. I thought it was wall street. I thought it was REITs and like wealthy people. I didn't know like anybody can go do it. So I was like, okay, this guy on stage is saying that I can do it. I'm going to sign up for coaching signed up for coaching. But this time I was like, I am not 
going to quit until I do this. Cause I see that there's huge opportunity here. And so I signed up, I showed up, I never quit. And within nine months, we closed a, a 212 unit, uh, closed a 208 unit shortly after that. Then uh, with the ADPI team, we closed a, a 80 unit and a 71 pad mobile home park. That was in one year. And I'll say it's so 571 units in one year. And I want to say one of the other things, intention matters. Um, we're talking about Cardone and 10X. I had also read 10X rule and I was on this like bigger pockets train of like, okay, all I need to do is start with a single family turnkey. And the next year I need to buy two. And then the following year I need to buy four and then eight and 16 and 32. And then I'm done. And so I was on that I was on that path. Like I was on the year where I needed to buy eight, I think. And I said, what happens if I buy, if I say my goal is 800 and that's when all that happened. So because I set my goal at 800, my brain, my subconscious, my friends, the way I talked, whatever it was, we ended up closing almost 600. Now, if I had stayed at eight, I would have closed six. So, you know, that's not BS. That was just the path of my 2019 for me. And uh, so that was one whole year. And then from there, you know, 2020 came, you know, all we did was just ran our assets. We didn't buy anything in 2020. We wanted to make sure that our investors were taken care of. We wanted to make sure that that was going to be all golden and it worked out really well. And now we're selling four assets. So it's really cool to watch all that go full cycle, full circle and full cycle. And um, yeah, so we're buying storage facilities now, um, lots of stuff going on. And, uh, I, I just, I love, I love how dynamic real estate investing is. It's just my favorite thing. I, th I think everybody needs to rewind that section there because the part where Eric is talking about intentionality matters, we cannot emphasize that enough. I love the example of focusing on 800, got you 600. We're focusing on eight can get you six. It is as true as true can be. Uh, with that being said, you have to identify what your ultimate goal is. If your goal is only eight for whatever those reasons are, then that is perfectly fine. You do not have to chase this lofty, ambitious goal if that's not in line with your true why and your true purpose. But understand that, yeah, you get the right people together, you have intentionality and drive, bam. I, I didn't even add them up, but I wrote them down. 212, 208, 80, and 70, all within 12 months. And then the next part is, focused on acquiring, and I love this piece, focused on acquiring, then management, maximize efficiency, make sure they're cash flowing. And guys, two years later, two years later, you're already selling some and looking for more. It does not have to be this 30 year or 40 year journey, you know, for, for each one of these. So rewind that doing whole this, thing. Yeah. I've been doing this three years, commercial, multi, commercial multifamily, or just commercial real estate in general. And, uh, we're at a uh, thousand fifty two doors with four hundred and thirty nine under contract. And that. it's any guys, I am not special. Uh, you know, Dan 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 was joking earlier about being a, uh, us being a big deal. I am not special. Anyone listening to this can figure this out. It's not rocket science. You just have to have intention, know what you want, have a deep rooted why, and commit to the process, learn it's a well traveled path that anybody can do. There's a, an abundance of apartments. There's a, an abundance of single family. There's an abundance of storage facilities. You just have to know what you want and then just go, just go get it. You deserve it. If you're listening to this podcast, you deserve the life of your dreams. You just have to go take charge. Damn right. If you guys can follow instructions in the military, you guys can follow a playbook for apartment complex. <laughs> no, the military, military members are the best suited for this industry because we can follow rules and instructions. If there's an SOP, I mean, there is essentially all these books out there. You can read the podcasts on multifamily or whatever your niche is. That's all an SOP. Write it back out, write it to yourself and just commit to the process and just be 1% better. That's all you got to do. Yeah, I, I absolutely love it, man. Like, so just recap, right? If you're listening, just think about this for a second. I know a lot, we have a lot of uh, a lot of service members who are in the transition period of getting out and they might be enlisted, they might be officer, whatever the case may be, right? So we talked about a deliberate process uh, going through, starting, starting with uh, the live-in flips, figuring out what you can do where you're at, right? And then we networked our ass off, stayed true to a process, and now look where we are. I, I think that's, I think that's absolutely amazing, man. Like, and, and just like you said, dude, if, if, 
you can do it, if you can stick to the process, then, you know, you're, you're good to go. And it's crazy because we interview so many military members, right? They're just crushing it in all aspects of different types of uh, different types of real estate. We got the Airbnb, we got the syndication, of course, you know, we got the mobile home parks, we got the uh, storage facilities. It's wild how it, it's just wild. It, it's great to see so many other service members just like out there crushing it, man. It, it really, really is. It's super motivating. So what's next for you? I mean, we got, we're up to a thousand doors. Obviously you're still going to be acquiring more, but what is uh, the next step in your investment journey? And after a certain point, after you get to acquire some doors, what else is uh, in your path? More importantly than any of that stuff. So number one, if you're starting, you have to have a deep rooted why. I serve with the memory and pride of those who've gone before me for they love to fight, fought to win, and would rather die than quit. That is what drives me. You need to have a why that when you say it gives you the goosebumps and will get your butt out of bed. Okay. Next, next most important thing from there is who are you going to serve? Yeah, we have an amazing community of 40,000 members in, in ADPI, and, and that's going to be 100,000 next year. And, and we're serving them and telling people what we wish we knew when, right? But we also donated three houses to Veterans Community Project last year. There are a lot of things we can do. I'm going to raise, we're, we're going to raise half a million dollars, if not more, next year for Veterans Community Project. And to me, and we also donate our book, which talks about how to use your VA loan. There's a full chapter in there, like soup to nuts, how to use the VA loan. Only 13% of veterans eligible are using the VA loan. So you take a homeless veteran, which is veterans community project. They bring them in and put and they build tiny home communities. You take a homeless veteran, give them our resource, the military house hacking book. It tells them how to, how to uh, repair, build and maintain credit. And we're launching the, uh, the second edition on veterans day. It teaches them how to create a solid financial foundation. It teaches them how to use the VA loan. It teaches them the uh, differences between assets and liabilities, good debt versus bad debt. You can go from veteran homelessness to veteran home ownership just by having that, um, that situation at Veterans Community Project, reading our book, using the resources available. So philanthropy is just the most important thing, whether it be serving our community or actually helping homeless veterans. Um, you know, I'm honored to be at this position now where we can focus on some of the stuff like that and, and really just service. I mean, service is the biggest thing. And that goes to uh, anyone getting started in this niche as well. If you go into it with a service mentality of like someone you're trying to network with, serve them, find out what their problems are and help them solve that, help them find a solution. That's service. That's how you get started. So lots of, lots of cool things. It's not all about the real estate. It's an outlet for me. It, it relieves some of my, my, my PTSD and my, the, the, the things I go through, it keeps me busy and it keeps me passionate. And that's the most important thing for me. You can tell that. by how fast I talk about this stuff. <laughs> Sometimes I lose track of where I am, even my own thoughts. Cause I'm just all over. <laughs> I love it. Now, this, this is so important guys, because you know, when time and time again, you're going to hear more and more successful people say that they give back. There's a reason to that. It's not just for fluff. It's not just for, for media, for hype. It's because as soon as you make a certain amount of money, money is irrelevant. You know, the studies say that, it, you know, the average income of $80,000, once you achieve that amount of money, you're not any happier than the next guy. So you have to find some sort of internal motivation, purpose, and why to keep you happy and keep you driving towards something in the future. And for Eric, it's something that he's tied to closely that he had an experience with. For you guys, it may be something that it's in your past as well. But I love hearing that. Um, if you don't mind, if you don't mind me asking you, um, you mentioned that this is a way for you to kind of deal with some of your PTSD. Yeah. And I know a lot of service members have this, this uh, impact in them, and they don't really like to talk about it. Would you mind telling us just a little bit about some of the struggles that you faced with that as you went through this journey and some of the solutions you found along the way? Yeah, you bet. So I, I was, you know, I, as I mentioned in a special operations, you know, there's a lot of death. Um, and, you know, I, I was the burial detail NCOIC um, as an additional duty. Uh, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do was carry my buddy to his final resting place, place after knowing him for, for many years and listening to his mom cry as I'm folding the flag over his casket. Hardest thing I've ever had to do and, and maintaining military bearing. Now, if that doesn't leave a scar 
um, I don't know what would. So, um, especially after watching the crash and, you know, all that stuff. So, uh, so for me, I, I, when I came back to the Bay area, I, and I was in a high speed unit, fun, loved it. Yeah. There were bad things and they were tough to get to, but guess what? Next day you don't have time to grieve. And if you go see a behavioral health specialist, you can get kicked out of the unit and go to the needs of the army. So, so for, for us, it was kind of just suppress, move on, you know, the next day you got a deployment coming up or whatever it is. You got, you got a thing to do. So when I got out and I was running around doing my W2, I'm in San Francisco. And I remember very specifically exiting on third street in San Francisco, seeing a homeless veteran there. And I, I was like, I bet you that guy 20 years ago had no idea he'd be sitting here on the side of the road in San Francisco. So what's wrong with me? Is there anything wrong with me? Cause I don't feel like anything's wrong. I loved what I did. I loved my service. I, you know, proud of it or whatever. So I ended up, I said, you know what? I owe it to my, to my wife and my kids. I'm going to go to the VA and just see a psychiatrist. Day one, I was in tears. First meeting, I learned about survivor's guilt. I learned about a lot of things that I had pent up that I did not even regard as truth. I was just, so anyway, long story short, I was in the VA for three years, cognitive processing therapy, therapy, prolonged exposure therapy, and just kind of working through some of the stuff that I didn't know was there. And, you know, I think sometimes what it would, what my life would be like if I hadn't done that. And, and now I've found an outlet in helping other people. We have a massive community that we can help. And I get like, I get my endorphin hits and my adrenaline and my dopamine and serotonin from that from helping a coaching student or from helping someone just get started and realize that there's a new thing out there. I love that thing. And, and that's ultimately what veterans, uh, for, for you civilian folks listening to this out there, that's what veterans want. We, we continue after service seeking what the military gave us. That's why we, we rage out or we get arrested or we get divorced or we, there's abuse and alcoholism. It's because our body is innately seeking what it just had which was awards and accolades and adrenaline and dopamine and serotonin. So we get out in the civilian world and there's nothing. You're like, well, I don't trust the guy in the cubicle next to me. He's a jerk. He, I can't, he didn't, he doesn't know how to carry me across the finish line if I'm hurting, you know, and your buddies in the military did. So the importance of what you do and what we do is to show people that as long as you have purpose, as long as you're breathing, you have purpose and you just got to go out there and, and find it. So I found that, uh, through military real estate investing and, um, and you know, now it's just, there is no quit in me. There's, there's no way we're going to end veteran homelessness this, this decade. We're going to educate millions of veterans and active duty service members on how to create a side hustle and just live your best life and how to transition without killing yourself. I had too many suicides still happening. So anyway, you know, for me, what I do day to day is therapeutic and I hope that someone listening to this will realize that I don't care if you start a Jeep club or if you start real estate investing, whatever it is, find your passion and just go all in. Just be, that's you. Go do it and go be the best at it. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, that that's something that, again, most people do not talk about. And for anybody who's listening who feels like you are in that place where you're just mentally battling with what's next, why am I not motivated? Where is my purpose? Where is my... Guys, rewind that, you know, um, there's plenty of services within the VA itself. Don't be afraid to reach out and talk to any of us, right? We'll, yep. we'll try to help out where we can, but thank you again for sharing that. Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely appreciate the, uh, your, your, your candidness with that. So it's a, it's a very powerful, uh, moving story for sure. Um, and it's also uh, very helpful to, uh, to the audience, man. That's, that's good stuff. I love, I love your why. Absolutely love your why. That's great. Yeah. My, my hardest day is, is my brother's, you know, is my brother's best. So I, I just, when I think about that, I, I wear, <clears throat> I wear a memorial bracelet and it's sharp. It has sharp edges. And, you know, every time I get pinched, if I'm in the gym and it, and it scar, it cuts me or it hurts. I just remember that that pain is nothing compared to what somebody else endured for me to have the opportunity to go crush it in real estate. How cheesy, how dumb does that sound? I'm going to have a hard day right now. I'm killing myself in the gym right now. Well, I'm breathing. So I, I deserve, they, I deserve a, a, a life worthy of their sacrifice. I have, it's my duty to go out there and, and just never quit because they no longer can, they can no longer do this. So, and it's, that's just passion at its finest, man. You, you guys, you guys got it too. So. 
Uh, that, I mean, we, we always talk about some of the, why is life so hard? Why are we struggling? This, that, and the third. And I think Eric brings up a very, very strong point that many of us overlook. Believe me, I fought with depression myself. Plenty of my friends have too. It, it's a big thing in the military. But we have to realize just because we are alive and walking this earth, we are already one out of 400 trillion chances of being yeah. here, right? And now above that, we have all the other people that are passing away, whether it is through suicide or just through accidents in life. And we are still here and we are still breathing. So we need to make the best out of every single day. Um, right. It's something that's very serious there. Um, now, now we got all this in, we have your why. Um, now we're gonna start wrapping up a little bit here because we did cover a lot of information here. But if you had one piece of advice to give to somebody who is looking to find their why. We're going to switch it up a little bit. Who is looking to find their why? What piece of advice would you give them? Yeah, I, I would say you need to look back, reflect. I mean, take some time with no phone, go out in nature or something, and just think about things that you would do naturally in, in a given situation. Come up with a lot of situations like, okay, you went to college. What did you study? What did you, what did you want to, which classes did you want to go to? Or, Hey, you, uh, you you have a couple buddies, one worked in an auto mechanics shop and one worked at a library, which one would you want to go visit? And, and just, like, that's a stupid example, but like, those are things, those are clues to who you are. And if you go down that rabbit hole of like what you gravitate to, that's, that's how you're going to figure out what you're going to be successful at. So you know, with, with success, if you want to find success, you have to have that deep rooted why, and you have to have your identity. And so, you know, the success formula is learn all you can network your butt off, add value to others, take massive action. If you do those four things with the intention to be 1% better daily, success will hunt you down. So if you're listening to this, you don't have to go find it. You have to know who you are, have intention, have a deep rooted why. Yep. Mic drop, man. That was, yeah, that was it right there, dude. That was it right there. Um, absolutely love your passion. I mean, I, I know every single person listening to this episode has gotten some uh, serious value out of uh, everything we talked about here and all of, um, uh, you know, everything you talked about and, and, and can feel your, feel your passion there, right? Um, how can our, our audience get in contact with you? Yeah, you can find me on Facebook, um, Real Eric Upchurch on Instagram, um, our community, obviously, um, Active Duty Passive Income, you can find me there and love to reach out, what, whether it's real estate investing or if you're hurting or whatever it is, you know, we're all brothers and sisters in arms here and uh, we should be supporting each other either way. Excellent. Excellent, man. Um, again, Eric, thanks so much for coming on. Really, really appreciate uh, uh, everything you just added, everything you just talked about there. Just yeah, I'm kind of don't really have many words right there. Just really, really pow powerful. Um, I appreciate you coming on, sharing your story uh, with the audience. Um, you know, thanks so much. I'm glad to, and I'd love to come back when we end the veteran homelessness problem. Okay, can you guys have me back nice. on when we do that? Absolutely. It's a solvable Absolutely. problem. We're gonna figure it out. So that'll be a Excellent. good episode. Excellent. Hey, uh, we're gonna wrap up the episode uh, with that. This is Dan Wynn and Mike Glasby signing off.